Hey everybody, and welcome to Pedal Powered Anthropology's Introduction to Biological Anthropology. If you watch my other video, Introducing Anthropology as a Whole, you already know that biological anthropologists study humans as animals. Studying humans as animals implies that biological anthropologists also study human biology. And since the science of biology is founded on the study of evolution, it's also implied that biological anthropologists study human evolution. And lastly, given that humans are primates, it's implied that biological anthropologists also study primatology. Biological anthropology emerged as a science in the middle of the 19th century, although at the time it was called physical anthropology. And in the very, very early 20th century, Franz Boas, the guy who founded the American four-field approach to anthropology, was conducting really a groundbreaking study on human variation. And in essence, what he was doing was studying immigrants as they entered the United States. And he measured various traits and characteristics and compared them across racial lines. And he did this with some 10,000 immigrants, which is a huge study by any measure. And what he found was that regardless of how attributed a given trait is to one race, no characteristics are unique to any of the races. And as such, he concluded that since the variation that we see in any race really can pop up to a greater or lesser degree in any race, any positive or negative associations we have with a race has to be the result of a culturally created stereotype. And he was right, of course, and countless studies since then really have backed up his findings. But that was over 100 years ago, and he came to conclusions that really today we're still struggling with in a lot of ways. And what he was getting at, even though he didn't have the terminology available to him, was the difference between genotype and phenotype. And genotype is sort of the sum total of genetic material available to a population or a species. The phenotype is what actually shows up in the population. So if you think of you and your parents, your parents are the genotype. They have two different sets of DNA that's sort of sloppily chopped in half and mushed together, and out pops you. You are the phenotype. You are the manifestation of a combination of genetic material. So that's kind of the difference between genotype and phenotype, only on a, on a much smaller level. And assuming that Boaz was correct, and he was, how can we explain the tendency for certain characteristics to pop up with pretty reliable predictability in different regions across the world and therefore be attributed to race? If, if race as a concept is biologically inert, it's just sort of something that you can see, but it's really a superficial characteristic that doesn't mean anything one way or the other. And if everybody has it in them, how do we explain the, the reliability that these traits pop up around the world. Well, we can understand that through studying the various processes by which evolutionary change occurs, and in particular, the process called the founder effect. And the founder effect occurs when a small subset of a population leaves a larger population, doesn't come back. No more sexual exchange is never to be heard from again. And they go on and start their own thing and they're perfectly happy with it. That subset of the population that has gone on to do its own thing might not be exactly the same in phenotype as the population it left. Sort of like you're not exactly the same as your parents. That writ large is the founder effect. And sort of a really cool classic example of that that is not hypothetical is Amish people. And when the Amish population was founded, it was a very, very small bunch of people. And in that group, somebody was polydactyl. They had an extra digit on their hands and or feet. Not very common. And when you have something that has a less than 1% chance of occurring, and then you have it in a very small group of people, somebody has it, that's a much different phenotype drawing from the same genotype. More recently, researchers have sequenced the DNA, sequenced the genomes of humans and also non-human primates. And somewhat counterintuitively, 
it's been found that humans really don't have a lot of genetic diversity relative to other primates. So much so that if you were to compare humans with chimps and you took the two most genetically diverse humans that you could come across and compared them to any two chimps, they would have way, way less genetic diversity between the two of them than would any two chimps from a given region or even social group. It's a huge difference. And how do you explain that? I mean, we're humans. We're supposed to be the best at everything. We're supposed to be the most diverse and the most widespread and the smartest. And looking at chimpanzees, we're, we're practically inbred. There's not a lot of genetic material to choose from there. Well, in trying to sort that out as biological anthropologists, what do we know about humans versus chimpanzees? Well, if you know anything about humans, we don't stay put. We are a migratory species. We've been to and populated everywhere on the planet. Even those places that are incredibly inhospitable to human life, we set up artificial environments and we live there anyway. We've set up artificial environments in the oceans and we can live there indefinitely. And this is to the extent where we have left the planet and we live in outer space for months on end and we are moving ever closer to the inevitability of being able to live in outer space indefinitely as well. So humans don't stay put. That much is obvious. Chimpanzees, however, not really the case. They're not entirely migratory. They live in sub-Saharan Africa, sort of a belt that goes across the mid part of the continent. And they had a bigger home range, a bigger territory historically, but that's sort of ever diminishing because of environmental destruction and climate change. But for the most part, they've always been within Africa. The fossils of chimpanzees have been found in more northern regions of Africa, as far as Kenya. But the fossil record for chimpanzees is actually really impoverished. They tend not to live in places that have soil that's conducive to fossilization. So there were no chimpanzee fossils, really, until about 2005. But it's safe to assume that they didn't have super wide migratory patterns in the past. They only exist in Africa. And now, moving back to the genetics, researchers have found this really cool bit of DNA called mitochondrial DNA. And what's really cool about this is it exists outside of the nucleus of the cell. It is not subject to sexual recombination. So when parents get together and do their thing, the mitochondria is just passed straight down from mother to child. Father has nothing to do with it. It's only mother to child. Could be mother to son, mother to daughter, mother to whatever, but dad has nothing to do with it, ever. Because of this, it mutates very predictably. You don't have to take into consideration how often mating occurs or any of that. And because of that, researchers have been able to sort of count back those mutations and track migration routes. Because I already said that genetic data is lost through the founder effect, the phenotype changes. That means that going back through time, and you have populations diverging through time, so going backwards through time and looking at those points of convergence in the past, you have an increase of genetic diversity when a population reunites with its ancestral population. So in measuring the increase of genetic diversity throughout different regions of the world, researchers have been able to recreate on a broad scale migration routes. And that's why you're able to spend a hundred bucks or whatever and get 23andMe or Ancestry or whoever to sequence your genome and tell you your ancestral migration route. It's kind of like a family tree, but it's really not. It's a much broader sense. It's not gonna tell you who your 10th great grandfather was. It will tell you that you share DNA that's typical of people from Ireland or something like that. It's really cool though, it's worth checking out. And in counting back these migration routes, researchers have found, one, that through mitochondrial DNA, everyone, everyone on the planet alive today is a direct descendant of one woman, one woman who lived less than 200,000 years ago in Africa. We are all related to her, and that's amazing. And furthermore, as we pick back those 
mutations that see those points of convergence as half. The populations in Africa, the tribes that are still living sort of hunter-gatherer lifestyles, haven't really intermingled with Western populations at all, that are, have always been thought to have been sort of the oldest cultures in the world. Those people not only have the oldest DNA, they also have the greatest diversity of DNA. They have sort of their own unique stuff, and they have everybody else's stuff too. So you can see that all the other populations in the world drew from that gene pool as we set off to take over the world. And that is really, really super cool. Comparing our gen genomes with chimpanzees once again, we can see that at some point in time, as predicted by biologists long before DNA was ever discovered, we share a common ancestor with chimpanzees. I've got to stop for a second and just clarify what's meant by humans and chimps share a common ancestor. Humans didn't evolve from chimps. Scientists don't say that, and science doesn't say that. And anybody who does say that, or says that scientists say that, they don't know what they're talking about. You can tell them that I said that, and that every other scientist ever said that. They don't know what they're talking about. Because what science actually says is that humans and chimps share a common ancestor. Similarly, you and your cousin share a common ancestor. You share a grandparent. Your cousin is not your parent. That would be weird. It, it's similar to that on a species level. Humans and chimps share a common ancestor. And that misconception, I think, is spurred from the idea that we're more evolved than chimpanzees. We're not. We're just differently evolved. We diverge from that common ancestor. That common ancestor wasn't a chimp or a human. It was something else. And in that intervening time, we've never crossed paths really again. So we have just as much time to stew in our humanness that they've had to stew in their chimpness. They're just as good at being chimps as we are being humans. We may think that they're dumb, but that's only when we compare them to humans. They're way better at being, at being chimps than we will ever be. So humans did not evolve from chimps. We share a common ancestor. Anyway, humans share a common ancestor with chimpanzees. And it's estimated that that last common ancestor lived between five and seven million years ago. Now again, I gotta step back, that's a big range of time. Five to seven million years is like incomprehensible. But I have to stress that that window is not given out of lack of confidence, it's given out of caution because the researchers that give these estimates, that do this research, understand the complexities involved in the calculations. Similarly, when you call the cable company and you're like, hey, I want to set up my internet. And they're like, all right, we'll be there Friday between 12 and 4. And you lose your mind because that's a huge window. And you're so mad and you have to take a day off of work and you hate everything in your life. That window isn't given because they don't know what they're talking about. It's not given to mess with you. It's given because they do know what they're talking about. They know what their Friday looks like. They know that things come up. They know that traffic happens. They know that emergencies happen. They know that certain service calls take longer than others. And they know that sometimes things come up, especially when someone starts freaking out about the four hour window and demanding that they be forced in at an earlier time. But they know that they're going to be there Friday, early to late afternoon. So it's kind of the same when it comes to these predictions of last common ancestry based on either DNA or the fossil record. It's just that when you're dealing with millions of years, the cable guy needs to give you a bit of a bigger window, but he'll still be there. And on that note, we still have a lot of time there. I said how we know that we're all related to one woman who lived a bit less than 200,000 years ago. And us as a species, anatomically modern humans, started popping up on the African landscape. We're pushing it to around 300,000 years at this point. But that's still best case scenario 
4,700,000 years where what happened since we diverged from chimps. So that's where we have to turn and look at the fossil record. And given what we already know, just from this video, we know that humans are migratory. They get around a lot. Chimps, not so much. And we know that we shared a common ancestor, let's just say six million years ago to make this a shorter video. That being the case, we can safely assume that either our common ancestor was migratory and chimpanzees ceased being migratory, or that our common ancestor was not migratory and somewhere along the line, our lineage developed the tendency toward migration. Doesn't matter which one, all we know is that we're migratory and chimps aren't. And I already, we already know that the fossil record involving chimps really isn't particularly complete. So it'd be tough to do this thought experiment with them anyway. So based on those things that we already know about the tendency of humans and how long ago we shared an ancestry, we can predict that if the genetic data jives with fossil record and that if the tendency of humans to be migratory stretched deep into our ancestry, we would see right around the time of the last common ancestor some kind of critter that was neither chimp nor human had some traits suggestive of both but definitely wasn't either and then moving more recently you're going to see dotted around the african landscape as our lineage in a broad sense starts migrating around and making it to places with soils that are more conducive to fossilization in the first place you're going to start seeing more and more fossils going through time and eventually you're going to see a whole mess of them because i mean we're dealing with millions of years lots of founder effects lots of time for speciation to occur because time and isolation equals species and then eventually you're going to see some of those individuals moving out of africa because we we know we made it out of africa and then eventually you're going to see a dwindling of different forms because we know we're left with just us. In some senses, it doesn't matter how many there were. It just matters that there were multiple and we know we're the last one left. And looking at the fossil record, that is exactly what we see. Right around six million years, dated to the time of that last common ancestor, in Morocco, researchers have found an animal called Sahelanthropus chirensis. Definitely not human, definitely not chimpanzee. And realistically, it's probably not the literal last common ancestor. But honestly, that doesn't matter to me. It doesn't matter if this thing is definitely on the human lineage or definitely on the chimp lineage. It existed in the right place in the right time. And the funny thing about evolution is you don't just give birth to another species. There's sort of a gradient of transition where there's that founder effect. And then given enough time and enough different environmental pressures, the species will be different. But from one generation to the next, you don't notice it. You notice it when thousands of generations later, all of a sudden, these species are way different. But really it's a continuum of transition. It's not just one individual gives birth to a new species. So it's just as exciting to me, regardless of which lineage it's definitely on. It is representative of the time and place and environment and kind of animal that lived there. Who would be our last common ancestor? So really, it's good enough for me. Moving a bit more recently, around four million years, you see a few more individuals and they have varying degrees of human-like or chimp-like. There's some debate whether they are directly on the human lineage or if they're on some sort of offshoot and ultimately dead-end lineage. But again, that doesn't really matter to me because they're still representative of what human-like creatures were up to at the time. 
best representative of human life are these things. And this is where they were, what they were doing, and when they were doing it. I'm fine with that. Moving more recently again to right around 3 million years, sort of 3.2 million to 2 point whatever million, you have a much bigger proliferation of species. You have lots of different anatomical traits. You have some with huge dentition and massive sagittal crests to which the musculature was attached that powered their enormous jaws. Some had smaller jaws that were more human-like. Some had flatter faces. Some were already exhibiting sort of reoriented pelvises that were more indicative of upright walking than quadrupedal walking. And then moving closer still, once you get more recent than two million years, you start seeing a lot drop off. You start seeing a definite shortening of the fingers, definite flattening of the face, definite expansion of the brain case. Those shortened fingers mean that we're doing more human-like stuff with it. Orangutans have these huge long fingers. They can't grab like we do. They don't have the kind of dexterity in their fingers that we do. So it's around this time that you start seeing slightly more complex tools pop up in the archaeological record. And more and more, these creatures are starting to look less and less like anything else but human. And eventually, you start seeing them pop up in parts of Asia and throughout Europe. And as we know, we're left with us. So all of that time, through each of those founding populations, they took and lost a piece of the overall genetic diversity with them. And given enough time, which we know we had, and we know that a lot of those parent populations, they're gone forever. So a lot of our genetic variation is just lost due to our tendency to roam around. Chimpanzees never really did that. And looking back to the genetics, there's another driving force of evolution called the bottleneck effect. The bottleneck effect is very, very much like the founder effect, with the notable difference that it's involuntary. You have that parent population, the big, wonderful, happy population, then something terrible happens. Most of them are gone, they're just dead. So with that, you have a founding population with a different phenotype than the parent population had, but the parent population just no longer exists. You don't have that option to go back and interbreed. And in our genome, it's evident that one such bottleneck occurred around 120,000 years ago. And in this bottleneck, it's estimated that the total population of humans worldwide was reduced to around 26,000 people. And I don't know how you feel about that, but that's, that's not really that big. $26,000 in a paper bag at the bus stop is a lot of money. 26,000 people worldwide the town I grew up in is 26,000 people. 26,000 people is not a lot. And then, looking at the geology, there's evidence of a supervolcanic eruption called the Toba eruption. It happened about 70,000 years ago. And it's estimated that somewhere between 3,000 and 10,000 people worldwide survived this. 10,000, that's nothing. That's actually the sample size of Franz Boas' original study on race and variation in humans. It's a big sample size, but it's a tiny population. And those catastrophes aren't borne out when we look at chimpanzees. They had a very different evolutionary history. They had just as long to evolve as us, but turned out very different. So there you have it. We've looked at humans and chimpanzees as animals. We've looked at their migratory patterns. And we've looked at their DNA. We've looked at the fossil record and seen how that correlates both to the DNA and to the migratory patterns that we see in each species. And we've also taken a look at the DNA and the geological record to see evidence of catastrophe that drastically altered the genetic makeup of humans, but not chimpanzees. In a nutshell, 
that's my logical anthropology. I hope you've enjoyed watching. If you've enjoyed the video, click like. If you want to see more stuff like this, click subscribe. And if you have any questions, comments, suggestions, or whatever, I think you know how to get in touch with me. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again soon. Thank mm -hmm. you.